Hi, my name is Robert Shutt. I usually work with my good friend Luke Johnson uh, from Noetic. We discussed the possibility of having a little project where we would make a short biography of Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, and Luke has so many other projects that he's trying to work on, so I agreed to take this on as a project of my own. So let me begin with a short pro uh, biography of Kierkegaard. This is not extensive, but it just gives you uh, an idea of the kind of life, where he lived it, uh, what motivated his writings, and so forth. Uh, it's very important to have this background information on uh, this particular philosopher anyway, because it shows uh, an influence in his writings, and it helps us to understand the message that lies within his writings as well. He was born in, on May 5th, 1813, and he died on November 11th, 1855. That's really a short life. It's 42 years old, even today's standards or his standards in the mid-1800s. That's a, a pretty young, pretty short life. He spent most of his life in Copenhagen, Denmark, as far as we know, he really didn't travel very much. Uh, he traveled to Berlin, uh, and other than that, we're not aware of any, any travels that he had. So most of his life he spent uh, in Copenhagen, Denmark, and that is actually part of the motivation for his writings, having grown up in Denmark. <clears throat> as, you'll, as you'll soon see, the, the religious atmosphere in Denmark at the time. He never became an ordained minister, a professor, or as far as we know, he never even really held down a job. People might describe his life being somewhat morbid or religious, uh, that of an eccentric, uh, almost a recluse at times. Some might say that he was very introspective and antisocial and perhaps even suffered mental illness. Others might say that he had a very special genius that fostered or almost required such behavior. He spent much of his adult life protesting the established religion of his time, somewhat like Martin Luther did, although Martin Luther uh, created a religious movement, Kierkegaard really wasn't interested in becoming a religious leader. He dealt with very profound depths of the human psyche based upon his own understanding of his own self uh, as we'll see it's not really easy to put Kierkegaard into a category even though we may know a lot about his inner workings uh, because much of what he wrote about was biographical at least to some point uh, at least much of it, uh, of his biography or his uh, inner thoughts were revealed through his introspection. So we have perhaps a little more insight into Kierkegaard than we would uh, any other philosopher. Because we have such information, it's very tempting to try to psychoanalyze him as some have tried. But we have to take into consideration that his use of pseudonymous authors makes it impossible to know where they begin and where he leaves off. And a pseudonymous author is a, uh, a fictitious author, a fictitious name, and actually more than the name, but uh, a fictitious character that he uses to write some of his books. He was a man of keen humor and sarcasm that doesn't always come out. Sometimes you just have to look for his humor and his sarcasm. Uh, so that's one of the things I want to encourage you to do is as you're reading Kierkegaard, think about the, the possibility anyway of humor and sarcasm. I think it'll give his writings a different, uh, another layer uh, of meaning. We don't know how much he was actually playing with the reader uh, who might be trying to see through the disguise. So there's kind of a game going on with Kierkegaard and his reader. As though he knows the reader is going to try to make something out of this. So I'm going to prevent him 
for making anything out of this here. I'm going to only let him know what I want him to know. So it's very interesting to read him if, if you're aware of this. We can see many parallels between what he writes and his personal life. Uh, that's why we, Luke and I felt that uh, a biography was really necessary because his personal life comes through in his works. We see that he was prone to melancholy. He even admits to this, which is a term used for someone who has a feeling of what they call pensive sadness or typically sadness or depression with no obvious cause. Although he may have seen himself in these terms, I don't believe that it, it shows itself directly as such. He may have suffered depression at times, but there really were causes in his life for such depression. Uh, he had an odd family life as a child and his sense of loneliness in his religious purpose. He became very isolated, which can certainly create a sense of, of depression. I can't help but to ask how someone who suffered from clinical depression also would have been able to write so prolifically and profoundly, weaving his stories into such masterpieces. Such writing really requires extreme focus, which depression doesn't usually uh, account for. Uh, he may have, of course, he may have suffered bouts of depression, but I have a problem thinking of him as being someone who was overcome by it constantly. I mean, I have my own moments of depression and sadness, but I think that I have good reason for that. Uh, I don't let it get in my way of my performance, and I don't think it's clinical. It's a clinical disability. I use it to search deeper into my own psyche so that I might be able to empath empathize with others. Uh, his writings are usually focused and influenced by his local circumstances in Denmark, specifically Copenhagen. His religious life certainly seems centered upon the church in Denmark at that time and his manner in which they presented themselves. So his early life, I said, was centered around that particular area of Denmark uh, and he was influenced by the state religion, which was the Lutheran religion of his time. So there was very little going on outside the Lutheran church. On the personal side, his parents were peasants who began in the Jutland area of Denmark. And his father, Michael, was very poor as a child and had his own problems that seemed to begin with the story that Kierkegaard tells us uh, Relating to his, his father, Michael, when he was tending sheep or watching sheep one day, uh, and he was overwhelmed with the feeling that God had forsaken him. And so he turns and he curses God. And this incident that, that uh, Kierkegaard talks about seems to have haunted his father for the rest of his life. And Kierkegaard was raised under this kind of shadow and despair. Uh, all his child throughout his whole childhood and even his adulthood, early adulthood. His father told him that he shouldn't plan uh, too much for the future because he would more than likely die uh, at a young age, uh, probably before his father. And uh, this was called the, the, the Kierkegaard's family curse. And uh, actually, some of his siblings did die before their father, which kind of reinforced the curse in Kierkegaard's own mind. So imagine a young child growing up being told, don't make too big of a plan because you're probably going to die at a young age. I mean, and when to say that he he had depression without any reason, reason I'm not sure about that. that. That's, I think, a pretty good reason to be depressed. When his family moved from the Jutland era to Copenhagen, his, his father worked for his wealthy uncle. And as a result, uh, he himself became very successful and wealthy, so much so that he was able to retire at the age of 40. Now, Michael, which is uh, Soren's father's name, uh, his first wife died before she had any children. And then he soon married his servant, uh, or housekeeper soon afterwards. Five months after the ceremony, 
she gives birth to their first child. Uh, so you could probably understand why the wedding was rushed a little bit. But it gives you a little background into, again, into Sauron's family life. Uh, Sauron had brothers and sisters, but he was the youngest. And his father was a self-educated man. And he enjoyed discussing both theology and philosophy with the bishop of the church, uh, Bishop Minster, it's spelled M-Y-N-S-T-E-R, uh, who became a good friend of the family. But there was also other people that came in and out of the family. I mean, his family was a very wealthy family, well-to-do, uh, and played a big role in, I guess, the, the politics of that time in that area. Uh, his father was a, a little legalistic as far as his religious demands, and this drove Soren to, uh, at least it drove him in different directions. He wanted to study theology and philosophy at the local university. His father wanted him to become a pastor, and Soren used his, his depression to produce brilliant writings that reflected the depth and the insight into his own self. So with Kierkegaard, he didn't let his depression get the best of him. He used it to motivate himself to produce his wonderful works. One of the things that upset Soren most of all was how anemic the Christian church in Denmark had become. It became what's called a nice religion. Everyone who was born in Denmark was considered a Christian. So we have the religion and the state has kind of become one. As you became a citizen, you also became a Christian. Now, Sauron was uh, offended at this development. And this was what was behind much of his polemical writings against what he called Christendom. So he kind of gave it a different name here instead of calling it Christianity, which would have almost given it a sense of authenticity, he calls it Christendom to show that it's much more political in its, uh, in its motives and in its meaning. Uh, his family were members of the Lutheran State Church, of course, uh, and they also attended the Moravian services. Now, the Moravians were a pietistic group of Christians who tried to live a pure, passionate, and enthusiastic life in accord with their Christian beliefs. The Moravians were also responsible for inspiring John Wesley, who would start the Methodist Church movement. Uh, now, Soren didn't leave the Lutheran Church, for he believed that there were still many good things in it. Uh, for instance, the Catechism, which was developed by Martin Luther, uh, the hymns that they sang, uh, all expressed good, wholesome ideas of the Christian life. And of course, the liturgy, he felt, had, had value to it. So he kind of lived in this tension of his faith where uh, he saw the potential of the faith, but he also saw that they were not living up to that potential. His father, as I mentioned before, had close ties to Bishop Minster. Uh, one of the problems that Soren had with the bishop was that he saw in him uh, a desire for worldly success that he tied into faith. So that one would say, well, if God made you wealthy, then you must be doing something right. That kind of an idea of faith. Michael, his father, wanted him to become an ordained minister in the church, as we mentioned earlier. But Soren was having too much of a problem reconciling the church with the gospel teachings. And his concern was that the church was uh, accommodating reason with worldly progress uh, and was becoming, it, it began to dilute the teachings of Christ. So he saw the danger of the present day philosophy that was going on at the time, uh, specifically uh, the Hegelian philosophy. And he, he thought that the church was just getting too close to this philosophy, and it was taking them away from their true calling to be a Christian church. 
So philosophy, he felt, was beginning to dilute the faith and the, uh, the preaching and the intention uh, ministry of the church. Philosophy was trying to purge the faith of superstitions and miracles, which today we call demythologizing. Uh, in order to, what, what demythologizing is to remove what they call the myth out of the gospels. In other words, let's take the miracles out of the gospel and uh, the superstitions out of the gospel and we'll just leave it with the story of the gospel and that's demythologizing it. Making, get, put, putting it into its purest form. Uh, but in order to accomplish this, faith would have to be reclassified in such a way that it would have that it would really distort the true teaching of the gospel so by trying to surgically remove these what he calls myth from the story you're removing uh, in essence part of the telling of the story and you're left with an anemic form of the gospel philosophy was trying to uh to purge those miracles out at the time. And that's what Kierkegaard was against. Because of his, histor uh, because of his financial stature, Sauron really didn't need to have a job. At one point, he lived the fancy life of going to operas, coffee houses, and ballets. Uh, and he began to develop quite the reputation for himself of being kind of a dilettante, a man of the town of bon vivant. Uh, then in 1830, he entered into the University of Copenhagen, uh, but he wasn't satisfied with what they taught him at the university. He still read quite a bit about drama, poetry, and of course, philosophy and theology. We had to throw theology in there as well. Uh, but he was a kind of man who could have become whatever he wanted to be. He didn't just read drama, poetry, and philosophy. He just devoured it. And he, he became very proficient at all of it. Uh, like I say, he was the kind of man who could have done anything he wanted. I think they call him the Renaissance type of man. But what he wanted was to do something, in his own words, was to live or die for. He wanted something that would be passionate, that would give his life passion and meaning. He knew that he had literary talent. I, I think he knew he had genius and he wanted to at the same time to be accepted by the public, by the crowd. And I think this is part of an element as to how he's able to write about this because through his own experiences, I think he realized that wanting to be part of the crowd would, would create um, certain weaknesses in the individual, vulnerabilities that he, I think, explored and exposed in himself in his writings. But there was also an independent side to Soren where he wanted to be his own man. Uh, we could call him a man of contrast and a man of paradox for his whole life was internally antagonistic. He was able to somehow take this and maximize it to create his wonderful literary works. I think, I think internally, psychically, perhaps speaking, there was always a little battle going on with Kierkegaard, drawing him to the extremes of one position or the other position. And again, I think this is part of his genius. He was able to tap into that and, and to be honest with himself about his own thoughts. I think that comes out in his writing. Now, Kierkegaard took the death of his father pretty hard in 1838, but it did disconfirm the idea that his children would all die before he did. And after his father's death, he lived off his father's inheritance from then on, pursuing his intellectual, philosophical, and spiritual concerns. At this point, let me just make a comment about Kierkegaard's childhood, something that maybe many people don't realize. Since he was the youngest, he was really overprotected as a child by his father. Right after school, 
he immediately had to come home and he would spend the rest of the day at home. He wasn't allowed to go out and play with children. Uh, so he really had no childhood friends. All, this, all the people that he was exposed to were adults. So he would listen to his father debate with the bishop and with other authors, other famous people at the time. Uh, all, of course, developing his talent as a debater and as a good listener uh, and how to process the information. And he was in awe of his father's talent to be able to listen to all these people discuss and then to be able to come back and actually participate in the conversation. A man who really hadn't, uh, didn't have the letters, didn't have the credentials, was able to hold his own with some of the, the great minds of his time. And so this impressed Kierkegaard and perhaps made him want to live up to that kind of a reputation himself. The only outside life that Kierkegaard had uh, as a child was to go on, on walks with his dad. Uh, his father would, would take him for walks throughout the marketplace and point out different things, uh, explain things as he passed by them educating him. Uh, and in Kierkegaard's uh, words, he said he learned more by doing that than by doing anything else, uh, by these walks with his father. But again, this is the only exposure he had to, to the social world. So he probably grew up being, oh, very uh, socially inapt, at least as a child. Okay, he now took his theological studies uh, after his father died. Uh, and and I, the reason I told you the story is because I wanted you to understand why his father's life meant so much to him and why his death had such a great impact. Because as strict as his father was, he was pretty much his only friend, his only source of the outside world, his filter to society. But now at this point, he took his theological studies more seriously and he finally got his degree in 1840. His degree is said to be at the magister level, uh, but uh, which is a master's degree, but I've been told from very good resources, Luke is one of my resources, uh, that he actually received the PhD because his dissertation, uh, his thesis was so far superior to that of a master's degree. So they awarded him the full PhD. His uh, thesis was on the subject of irony. So uh, again, that should give us a little insight into the kind of writing that he does, why he, he considers irony so important. What may have driven him uh, was his reality of mortality. Uh, again, being a child and being told he's going to die at a young age and then having his some of his brothers and sisters die at a young age. It seemed like he lived his life burning a candle really fast, really hot, because he may just kind of realize he didn't have long. And so he was going to do everything he could in the shortest time that he had. Uh, this you know, possibly even had influence as to why he didn't want to marry, why he changed his mind uh, later as we get on to another story about his, uh, his engagement. He developed a style of writing which might be called ironic. And this, uh, through this style, he was able to engage the reader not only through the subject matter, but the manner in which he wrote. So we know... Uh, that he had these talents because in, in the university, he didn't study just theology and philosophy, but he studied language, he studied uh, literature and so forth. So he was able to weave these stories. He was able to use language uh, to his maximum benefit. Uh, I think that he truly discovered the power that a writer has, not only with the words, but how he can portray those words through irony, through storytelling, through paradox, which was really not heard of in those days. I mean, people would, would use certain of those talents, but Kierkegaard had control of all of those styles 
that he weaves in and out uh, to teach what he wanted to teach. So now, Kierkegaard's love life, it was kind of short-lived. Uh, he fell in love, apparently head over heels with Regina Olsen. Uh, some might pronounce it Regina. Uh, and she was uh, 18 years old at the time. He proposed to her soon after that, and eventually she accepted. As soon as she accepted it, he realized that he may have made a big mistake. And no one really knows for sure what the problem that he had with marriage. It could have been that he knew that he, he could not emotionally provide for a wife, and his tendency towards depression certainly may have been an element. Uh, it may have been that Regina was quite young at the time, and maybe he realized she really wasn't mature enough for somebody uh, like himself, somebody who would have to understand why he spent so much time writing, understand his ambition and his obsession, which was more than an ambition. Uh, and in a sense, he might have thought that she would become more of a burden than a partner or the other way around. He might have become more of a burden than the partner for her. Uh, so we'll never know for sure what it was that uh, created his sense of uh, regret for having uh, broken up. After he breaks off the engagement, uh, he kind of felt a little guilty he didn't want to embarrass her into thinking that uh, she got dumped in so many words. So he comes up with this grand idea to make himself look like the bad guy. So he goes around town trying to create a bad impression uh, that uh, he was kind of back in the days like he was the bon vivant, uh, that he was the villain. He was trying to portray himself that way. So it looked like she broke off with him because she really didn't want this breakup. But Kierkegaard had to continually stay after her to convince her that this marriage just wasn't going to work out. So between the years of 1843 and 1846, he did publish many volumes of his works almost fanatically. He published them in pairs when he, when he began it, during this period of time. Uh, the pairs were, one work was a pseudonymous author, which was the imaginative, fictitious author, and the other would be under his own name, which was more directly to the point and more of a religious nature. Uh, one pairing of this was the work Either Or by Victor Eremita, uh, which came out with its pair uh, the two upbuilding discourses, which were written in his own name. Now, Luke and I have, have already done the uh, upbuilding discourses, so you can find those on um, either YouTube or on the Noetic app. The public was not too impressed by his work at first. In other words, they didn't fly off the shelf. He didn't have bestsellers. People didn't run out and, and want to buy his works. Uh, he had a little bit of success, but he didn't really make enough money that we know of that he could support himself. It may have even cost him more money to uh, publish his works than it did uh, by selling them. But he wasn't discouraged by his kind of failure as an, uh, a new author. So he kept at it. So that should be maybe motivation for those who are uh, new authors. Don't let yourself get discouraged too quickly. In his works, there's evidence that he may have given Regina secret messages or clues about their relationship, but we can never really be sure about that. Uh, as you know the story, at least now that you know the story between Kierkegaard and Regina, Regina, you can almost see it in clues taking place in some of the stories that he tells and some of the wordings that he uses, almost trying to send her a message to say, this is why we had to break up. 
Some thinks that his writings give evidence that he realized that he had made a mistake in breaking his engagement with Redina. Uh, but one might think that this is kind of normal and that we all second guess ourselves, especially when it comes to romantic decisions. You know, he must have been partly lonely some nights while writing some of his darkest thoughts. Uh, it would have been hard for anyone to do such self-examination and have uh, no one comfort him. This, in those times, perhaps, that, that Kierkegaard thought, you know, I wonder what it must have been like. Well, I, I'm sorry, I wonder what it must or would have been like if I didn't break off the engagement with Regina. Now, I'd have somebody to kind of give me a little help, give me a little encouragement to soothe me when I'm having bad days as an author. You know, my works aren't selling for somebody to encourage me. And so I don't think that would be so abnormal to second guess yourself into wondering, you know, maybe I should have gone through with the ceremony after all. In 1846, he thought that maybe he ought to enter into the pastorate. But at this time, he entered into a relationship with a newspaper called the Corsair. Uh, it was a paper that was quite scandalous and filled with rumors and gossip of all the local famous people. Uh, the problem that Kierkegaard had is kind of unusual. He, the problem he had is that they didn't write anything bad about him. Everything they wrote about him was of a positive nature. And he was offended at that because of all the famous people, they were writing gossip and uh, scandals, but of him, they spoke highly. And so he thought, what's the matter with me? You know, uh, maybe I'm not famous. Maybe I'm not as good as I, I need to be uh, that they think my writings are just bland enough that they don't need to try to put me down. So he got the idea uh, that they didn't consider him perhaps worthwhile to slander. Uh, he didn't want people to think that he was in league with the paper or was in favor of what they did to others. So he wrote an article against them. So he didn't, he wanted to kind of disassociate himself with the paper. Uh, and when the editor got a hold of the article that he wrote against him, uh, it caused him to respond with cartoons, poking fun at Kierkegaard, exaggerating his deformities and his eccentricities, and even with his relationship with Regina. Because of this, he became the object of social ridicule. This was a pretty popular newspaper. So if they ridiculed you, uh, the public thought that they were entitled to kind of follow up on their own with this ridicule. It gave them license. And Kierkegaard, you know, knowing this story now, you can see in some of his other works that Kierkegaard writes about the public and about the press. And this is a story that he's actually speaking about. He sees how the public is influenced by the press and they act like mad dogs and they're, they're uh, given a false bravado that they feel, well, since the newspaper does this, we can do it too. Again, all this gives us a little insight. Unfortunately for Kierkegaard, the, the response was that he could no longer take walks, his little walks through town. Uh, he couldn't even go to church without people poking fun at him. Uh, and of course, this influenced his social life. He began to withdraw more and more. He saw himself in God's will and that he must devote his time, his full time to writing. So I think he saw himself as a kind of martyr and as a witness to the truth in this manner. And this idea of martyr and witness of the truth will uh, kind of come up a little later. Between the years of 1850 in 1854, he didn't really publish very much. Uh, it wasn't until Bishop Minster dies. Remember, he's the bishop of the local Lutheran church. He was also a good friend of the family. So it's kind of speculated that he wanted to wait until uh, the bishop died before he wrote anything more about the church. But once 
the bishop died, uh, he began a whole series of polemical writings against the established church in Denmark. The problem that he had with the bishop is that he would talk about Christian life as though he were a witness for the truth. And he did so understanding that the true Christian would have to undergo suffering and perhaps even martyrdom. But Kierkegaard didn't see Bishop Minster's life as an example of those uh, characters, characteristics. And Soren's concern for the church was that he felt that it was diluting the teachings of Christ and the New Testament, when it, at least when it came to discipleship. Uh, now, if we look at, a, at the, what we'd say, like a good example of a disciple, uh, we might, a modern day disciple would be Dietrich Bonhoeffer, person who uh, sacrificed everything for his faith and sacrificed his own life for his faith as well. So uh, Bonhoeffer would kind of fit that category as being uh, a martyr, or at least as being a disciple. Now, H.L. Martinson was then made the new bishop. And uh, there was a family connection there too, because he used to be Kierkegaard's tutor in theology apparently when he was studying theology in the university. And uh, Martinson writes the eulogy for uh, Minster's funeral, his ceremony. Uh, and this aggravated, really aggravated Soren because he saw Minster as more of a social climber, trying to become famous and accepted by the world, certainly not self-sacrificing and a true disciple of Christ. So in response to this, he wrote some pamphlets called The Instant to denounce the hypocrisy of the church. Uh, it was not the true church that he was against. And we have to make this very clear that it was this Lutheran church in Denmark and their practices in Denmark that he felt was uh, watering down or diluting the teachings of Christ, the, the actual uh, gospel teachings. And he wanted to wake Christians up to reintroduce them to the true message of the gospel. At this time, people began to give him a little bit more attention, read his books a little bit more. Uh, but in 1855, September, he collapsed in the street and he was brought to a hospital. But his brother, his brother here tried to persuade him uh, to kind of recant some harsh polemical things that he said about the church. Uh, but Kierkegaard refused, of course, uh, and also refused to accept communion given by the state church. And on November 11th, 1855, he died. And he said to you that the reason for his death is, is possibly associated to some type of tuberculosis, but no, no one really knows. Uh, and at his funeral, his nephew, denounced the irony that he was being uh, this given this kind of religious funeral by the state as if nothing had happened and as if Kierkegaard's life and and uh, writings against the church meant nothing just things just kind of went on their way as normal and so he saw that was very ironic with Kierkegaard so Soren Kierkegaard can be remembered as the father of existential, uh, existentialism. You now we probably hear this quoted frequently, but I'm not so sure that he really would have accepted such a title or even wanted it. Uh, his goal was to expose the deluded version of Christianity that had taken over his church, not by threatening the church, but by showing individuals the weaknesses of their faith through his writings. The question that he asks, I think throughout his writings is, are you really doing what you ought to do uh, as a Christian? And not only is the question that, that he asks in his writings, but it's a question I think we all, those of us who are professing Christianity need to ask ourselves, are we professing it? Are we actually living it and doing it? Or are we just professing it with our mouths? Existentialism has been simplified uh, to the term of essence over being. 
uh, there's no real good definition for existentialism, but this is the one I think you'll find in textbooks. Uh, essence over being. Essence is kind of who we are, while being is who we, we temporarily embody as human beings. He wanted us to think of ourselves more as a spiritual soul without the masquerade, without the costumes, without the false vibrato. Man as he must stand before God, naked and without excuse. So that is the another running theme throughout his work. He's trying to make us see ourselves in this purity of heart. Who we really are, as we would stand before God, who would just see right through every pretense and every pretext that we might try to pull. Uh, and so this ends our short uh, survey or our, our short uh, biography of Soren Kierkegaard. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that this will give you a little bit more insight as you continue to listen to Luke and I as we go through uh, as many works of Kierkegaard as we can. So hopefully you'll join us again. And in the meantime, uh, blessings to all and see you soon. Bye-bye.